this image I liked a lot, uh, which uh, in a way it, it was, uh, it also gives some of his psyche of, of this dismemberment of, of uh, a little, I think it was a little child, because he, he tore up the picture and then he left this piece of head and a piece of, another piece of his body, you know, six inches away on the wall. I shot all with flash. Uh, the police department doesn't believe, believe in available light. It's it's more in the details and minutiae of, of, of a crime scene. Throughout the existence of a photographer is sort of a pretty solitary. You're always outside looking in. You know? Now John Doe's apartment what we are looking through now was built uh, on, a, on a sound stage uh, by Otto Max, who, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a, a truly wonderful artist because uh, of the little creations he, he uh, really went into the man's psyche uh, uh, in such detail that it was amazing. In one room, he set up like a, what seemed like a little museum of horrors, of of uh, images uh, about other other people's murders, about uh, other crime scenes, like glorifying it in, in such a way that it was actually artistic. Well, these are the uh, stills, uh, the crime photos on the gluttony set. David wanted to, wanted to be sure that we show immediately in the pictures that this man just ate, 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 and there's this tons of cans and bags of food all over the kitchen. I love this picture of, of the back of the man's head. You don't know if he's dead or alive, but he, by seeing these rows of fat, even on the back of his head, you get the message. The side view, well, there you see the whole thing. We had amazing makeup artists. Uh, Sloth was uh, like a combination of, of, uh, of, of images which showed so much degradation that you, you wondered how could a human being be put through that and survive, you know, five minutes. And uh, uh, it, it's, it, this was truly this one of probably the sickest of, of the murders for me to, uh, I mean, to, to photograph the, the aftermath. Luckily, the body was removed. <laughs> This is downtown Los Angeles, a, a real apartment where nobody lived for decades, I think. And it was just the filthiest thing. These are the, on the set of uh, Greed. And these photos at this point just show that this is a very wealthy man because of the marvelous artwork in his office. You had this. Uh, you had the sense that uh, she did not want to be seen like this ever, because he, I, she was a beautiful model. That she rather died. Uh, that was a, quite a comment. It's not as upsetting, at least not to me. Maybe because it's black and white, than what I imagined this could have looked in, in the real scene, in the real crime scene. And also what the police told me, the, the stench, the smells are so terrible that luckily <laughs> none of that I had to put up with.
My name is Peter Sorrell, and I am a, what they call a unit photographer, a still photographer. My usual work, of course, is 75% color, and uh, it involves the actors. The movies, publicity, and advertising dictates that that is what I have to do. You know, I start the film, I first read the script, and when I read the script, I know uh, immediately which half a dozen scenes or so are the key scenes in the film, which absolutely have to be covered really well. It doesn't mean that I won't cover the others, because many times accidentally something happens in a visual sense, but dramatically speaking, you have to do those scenes which, which will uh, enabled the production company to, uh, to uh, the publicity arm of the company to, uh, to market the film. The quality of the images, uh, the film is different, not quite so grainy as motion picture film. If you want to blow up a, a still frame from a movie, it will blow up to uh, not really a size of a poster, uh, because it would be grain size of your fingers, you know, it, it won't look very good. Whereas a, a, you know, a still photographer has the ability to pick a, a certain kind of film emulsion which will uh, enable him to have a, a, a frame which is really sharp. The grain is sharp and therefore it will blow up. What we do started out in the early 1920s when uh, to do a still shot you have to have a, you had a, a large camera, you know, and an assistant and everything stopped and everybody posed and this industry was based on that, that the still photographer is a, a, around the camera crew and around the actors and he works usually when the show, when the shot is finished, he comes in. By the 1950s, this changed into try to shoot while they are rehearsing or while they're shooting because we can't take that much time as, as it was possible before. All the rest, what, what I do, when you say, uh, oh, well, okay, you're an artist, uh, 
Well, I, it's very nice to think so. Uh, however, many times the artistic pictures would be totally unusable for their purposes. It, and I don't mean this as a judgment for any company. It is, uh, it's the reality of, of uh, what I like to do, maybe, uh, uh, is, is a picture of an empty set or, or of a shadow. And, and many times these pictures are totally useless. Uh, so you do this on your own time after you've done the, the, the material, uh, what you have to, why they hired you. That is why you're there and uh, first you perform, then you play. It was one of the most interesting projects for many reasons. One was that it was an intelligent script which made this terribly gruesome story visually and dramatically acceptable, I think, to the audience. The audience did not leave the movie theater gasping and throwing up because we never showed the bodies. We never, I mean, we showed very little of it. We never showed the actual act of violence, but only the outcome and the aftermath. So I really appreciated that. It was intelligent. I personally would much rather shoot during the actual performance because actors give their all by they doing it. And as much as they are, uh, they, they say or then they mean that they will do it again for you, they, it's a little different. When you do it for a still camera, oh, it's just a photograph. It's not important. When you do it for the film, you act. When you do it for a still, some actors act and some actors uh, sort of uh, sleep through it or smile 
pleasantly, you know, and that's not what we need. I mean, the drama is gone. I'm Clive Piercy, the um, art director on the on the project for the notebooks, John Doe's notebooks. And I'm John Sable, the designer for the books. And we're going to um, we're going to explain a little bit of how the process of how we we uh, we work together on this project and how we put the books together, and um, some of the references and ideas that, that came to bear in, in uh, bringing these things to uh, to life. We we got a call from. Arthur Max's office to design the the, uh, the John Doe notebooks, and um, I met with with Arthur and David, um, and uh, they outlined what they wanted. They'd had some work done before, and uh, no one, nobody was happy with it. They felt it was too kind of decorative, and they really had a specific look that they were they were they were after. They felt that we could do it, so we talked about references to a kind of um, the Stan twins and uh, Robert Frank and those kind of that whole kind of distant Witkin and all of those things. So they 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 knew what they wanted, and they they um, they asked me to go away and do some some ideas. And the thing they talked mostly about was the was the kind of um, it was the personality of his uh, handwriting. They wanted this kind of obsessive quality to the handwriting. So. I knew I couldn't. I knew I wasn't able to do that, but I thought that I knew what they wanted. So I'd known John for a long time, and John has this amazing kind of calligraphic hand. And so I called him up, and he came in and and just kind of took over. Yeah. <laughs> and he immediately got this handwriting just nailed, and we all of a sudden it started to the the the, the visual side of it took a backseat to this kind of incredibly Perverted, perverse stream of consciousness, yeah. you know, anal handwriting yeah. that yeah. this guy had to had to have. And they sent over this copy that John had to handwrite. You know, yeah. this, in this, you know, it was vitriolic. Yes. Well, I'd leave John alone for hours at the office. I'd just see him there, scrawling away at yeah, this stuff, painful. head down. Just, I mean, he got so into it. I mean, you couldn't actually, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't come up to him and speak to him. He was, his head was down. He yeah. was just. He was just churning this stuff out. It was, it was painful. Yeah, it was. The funniest, uh, there was a lot of funny things that happened, but one of the funniest uh, things that happened was the, uh, I, I would go to Kinko's and have these things, uh, I'd take the photograph, these photographs that I found that, that had like a, a woman with a uh, cloth, you know, it was like a death, she was dead and she had cloth in her mouth yeah. and she was drowned yeah. and bloated. I would take these really grotesque uh, images of murder and, and mayhem and I'd go to this Kinko's that was very, you know, down in Torrance, it was a real, <laughs> you know, peaceful little place yeah. and I would say, you know, I want these images put onto this plastic film. That's Remember right. the plastic yeah. film so we could yeah. overlay yeah. Uh, these things and we'd tape it and then after we got those we would tape the... Uh, the things with this with this yellow tape that we found, and it, it, that looked like it was like sexual. It was like after sex, you know, it was sticky and it was oh, goo, it was and it was just incredible. like it was like sheets, man. It was like yeah. God, yeah. you could just smell this and stuff. And the people at Kinko's were they just freaking oh, they were out. freaking out. Yeah. They didn't know what yeah. I did and what I was. And, yeah, they used to be real estate flyers. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. And they wanted, and these kids would look at this stuff when their little blue aprons, and they'd go, <laughs> Oh fuck, you know, what's this guy? <laughs> he, Look at each top of the page, and they're all uh, titled with lust, or you know, envy, or whatever. And uh, you know that we tried to alternate. Each page would have something happening that would be different. Little notations on the side, uh, photographs that would be placed in specific places that would be maybe overlaid over uh, 
copy and the, the transparency would actually go over the top. Then they have, uh, you know, a yellow piece of tape that would run and each corner would be tr try to make it as meticulous as we could get it on the, on the tape. We'd cut it so it'll look like that. I think that stuff is on the edge of, you know, it's schmuck, but it's safe pornography. There's a sexual kind of tension there. Or it's like bad art or popular yeah. art. If there's, if there's a way of this, John Doe wasn't kinky in a normal way. Yeah. He was even kinkier yeah, than the kinky course. guys in a kind of straight way. There's, I don't have another, another way of putting that, but I, but I definitely felt that way. That, that we couldn't use, we couldn't use uh, um, sexy porn pornographic pictures. He got turned on by mutilated limbs and you know decapitated people and people whose fingers had been sawn off. That to me is what he found sexual. Well, all the photographs that we kind of picked, the photographs would be, you know, a person that would be dying or someone that was tied up, almost like an S&M photograph. One day he says, I found, if, he says, I found this place somewhere down by you in Manhattan Beach yeah, or something, yeah, some yeah. old stationer's store uh, that had tape and, and oh, yeah. uh, that hadn't been touched since the 1950s. So he brought in all this, oh, he found this amazing archive of old glassine envelopes oh, was, and paper was, clips and stuff that we, that was like, and then we were like, God, this is amazing. We don't even have to, oh, we don't even have to it. age them of this stuff. Each one's taped on the, on the outside of the edge, the, the, uh, the rib of the, the bind, the binding on the outside. Each one of those books had a different library kind of tape that uh, was color coded and, um, so if, if it was uh, a green, this special kind of old green tape that we found, that would be like, you know, it could be envy or it could be lust or, you know, one of the seven sins. And then we both thought that these books, these composition books, mm -hmm. should be, uh, they should be so anal that the guy actually com made them, them again himself. And sewn them yeah, again, he yeah. sewed them up himself. That was part of the process. <laughs> so, he, so John hand sewed all this stuff, yes. put them in the oven, baked these things so they, yeah. so they went all kind of decrepit and old. Yeah. They, when they came out they were gorgeous. Each book was uh, hand stitched with uh, either a special like uh, laundry thread or a uh, suture and we, we actually did them with uh, operating needles because they were the perfect little bend to go in and, and working around all surgical kind of stuff. The, the mentality of the whole thing was to keep it kind of scientific and surgical and then you know, Clive kept saying, you got to make it more real. You got He kept pushing me because he was getting pushed to go that, that way. And I was getting really fed up. And, uh, you know, I'd keep going back through these files and I'd find, you know, stuff that the Crips wrote to my father in yeah. prison. And I learned the whole way they did stuff. And then there was this one uh, file that the guy committed suicide. And uh, there was a letter in there, the actual suicide oh, yeah. letter. And I thought, I That's oh, in. Yeah, I put it in That's once, it. and it, the guy killed himself. And Clive looked at this letter, and he goes, wow, how did you write this thing? And I said, it's real. And he goes, what? It's real. I go, the guy's dead. And there, there were t 